Greetings friends, and welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. This show is the first of our fourth year in podcasting, so it only seems appropriate that we go for a celebratory approach. Just kidding, we're covering The Black Corridor, one of the bleakest tales in Moorcock's oeuvre, but that doesn't mean we can't have some laughs along the way. For this preamble though, I'm going to posit a hypothetical scenario. It's the third decade of the 21st century. The UK has its most far-right government in living memory, putting even Thatcher's 1980s government to the sword in the competition to be the most hard-nosed, ideological, asset-stripping servants of opaque and dark forces driven by rampant greed. Unlike Thatcher's government, however, this lot are the most inept set of dunderheaded, barely sentient meatbags to have ever found their way to power on that sceptred isle. And they live out the fuck around, find out meme in real time on live TV, as their paymasters revel in and profit from the carnage. Even their own people stare at them in disbelief and wonder at how this came to be. But they lack the guts to grow a pair and do something about it because they have jobs and bungs to cling to, so the chaos and the damage continues unabated. Meanwhile, the poor get poorer, children go hungry, and the narrative that the poor are just feckless, and immigrants want to take our jobs, mooch off us, or kill us is propagated constantly by the media, leading those poorest in society and most fearful for their security to demonise each other and for the middle classes to look down on them. Unions are calling for general strikes. Even nurses, doctors, civil servants and lawyers are being balloted for action. A lot of people die before their time and a cold winter awaits. That all sounds pretty dystopian, right? The stuff of depressing, speculative fiction even. So how timely this book feels. When we talked about Moorcock's book of themed short stories, My Experiences in the Third World War, a few shows back, we commented a number of times on how Moorcock's relationship to his surroundings and the politics of the 50s, 60s and 70s, as well as World War II and his experiences as a child, informed his worldview and equipped him to write such poignant and cutting narratives that still resonate today. Or did we? I can't remember. Anyway, here we have another perfect example. Written in the shadows of Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech, The Black Corridor is a characteristically brisk and driving tale that, like my experiences in the Third World War, details trauma, brutality and societal decay. This is only the second time we've dove into the 1960s stream of what could be described as pure SF from Moorcock, although he did collaborate on this and odd other novels from that time frame, and more on that in the body of the show. It really does show a different side of him as an author, and it has perhaps a harder edge, but Given the subject matter, that feels entirely appropriate and, it appears, that some of that harder content is more down to his co-author, Hilary Bailey, than his wife. It's set against the backdrop of a Briton undergoing societal collapse, and it hits pretty close to home in places. It could be labelled a parable, a warning to the reader, a piece of contemplative science fiction that, thanks to Moorcock and Bailey's styles, offers little chance to absorb its depths on the fly, but it's a striking read, and it stares with you long after you've finished its meagre 120 odd pages. This was definitely the case for my co-hosts on this show. Derek Clunan, aka the fabulously talented creator of numerous bleak experimental electronica, Imria, drops into Derry and Tom's to talk about the book, his album based upon it, and his other recent project, The Dreamin' City 3. Then, Graham Holden, the duck pond sailor himself, calls in from the woods to talk about his experience with the book and his own musical meditations on the themes. Stay tuned after the transitions though, because some news has emerged in the world of Mokokiana that is both exciting, yet also a little bit frustrating, and we'll get into that in a bit. And we'll play the show out with a choice cut from Imria's The Black Corridor. And there's also a quick prize draw. As a result, this is a rather long one. So, check the cryosleep couches for any malfunctions, then grab some libations and join us on our journey down The Black Corridor. <laughs> So Derek, welcome back to Derry and Tom's. It's been a while. Uh, I think it's been maybe over a year since the last time we spoke. Probably more, actually. Is it two years? Shit. I don't know. I can't remember. Yeah, I think it might be. The pandemic has messed with my sense of time. But welcome back. It's lovely to have you. Glad to be back. And of course, we are going to talk about The Black Corridor, because as you're incredibly prolific with your uh, your musical output, you released an album interpretation of The Black Corridor. And because we had to cancel and postpone a couple of times, I think you've probably released about four more albums since then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, 
Three, maybe. <laughs> yeah, three. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but the last edition, of course, being your third variation on the Dreaming City. Yep. Uh, I think I had back when we first spoke about it. Um, when I was on, I had mentioned that I'd always I had intentions of revisiting it and doing different sort of inspirations of the the genres that I like pull from. So yeah. this most recent one was like my the prog version, <laughs> prog rock, space rock version of uh, the songs and approaching the story from a different perspective. And of course, you've had a, a couple of guest artists join you on that one as well. I did. It was uh, I intentionally uh, chose people out of your uh, your stock. <laughs> so I asked uh, Sonus and uh, Alistair, the, the Gateless Gate, to uh, participate and. I kind of just told them, choose whatever song you want and do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. It was just open-ended. With great results, I might add. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, each of them, they, you know, I had told them it was going to be prog rock inspired and they both did such a more a closer job to what I had intended in the first place of it to sound like. Because once I start writing, like, like maybe I want it to sound like prog rock, but it's just not really a genre I knew how to write. So I don't know. They hit. They really just hit it out of the park as far as getting the sound that I sort of had initially intended. And then all the songs I ended up writing kind of didn't even hit that mark at all. But like, I don't know. It was, it was funny. I'm glad that they added to it because that's kind of how I wished it would have sounded in the first place. But yeah. What process do you go through when you select uh, another? book inspiration is it just on the fly uh, what made you choose the black corridor for example sometimes i'll start by choosing the book first and then writing the music um or sometimes i'll just have a bunch of i'll, I'll write like five just song fragments um, and then i'll sit with them and see what story i start to see in my head when i listen to it hmm. <laughs> and then then when i decide that then i'll write the rest of the song and then and then order them so it goes back and forth with the black corridor i did it 100%. I just read the book two times in a row and then I wrote the album for it. It's a very, this album is a very like much more linear storytelling as far as like the music and the songs really line up with the book. Yeah. I usually don't do that. I usually like, we'll just take a character or a location and, and use that as the inspiration for the song. But this is a much more literal sort of musical journey through the book than anything mm. I've done uh, previously. So this was fun. It was a little, I guess, more annoying, so, annoying songwriting wise for me to like have that sort of focus in it, <laughs> like giving giving myself that direction. But it was also a good challenge to mm. figure out. So it was just simply a case of you happened to be reading it. You thought this is good fodder. Well, I think it had come up. I think on on the Discord chat, someone had mentioned it, and I was like, oh, that's such, uh. like, th that's something I should do a album on. So then I read it with the intention of like, how am I? how can I turn this into a album? What, like, what do I hear when I do it? And then while I was reading it, I was listening to a lot of Coil. Coil yeah. ended up being like a huge influence on this album. So then I, I read it the second time with more of a focus of where I'd want it to go musically. And then I wrote from there. And then I would choose, because the song titles happened sequentially in the book. So the second read was when I picked out what the song titles were going to be from like you know, to take a highlighter, go through the book and be like, all right, that's going to be the first song. That's going to be song two. And then I, I built it through that. Yeah. Uh, this was the first album that I didn't want to do the art for. Um, I was, I had read Black Quarter, like I said, two times in a row. And I was really focusing on the plot and the music that I didn't want to be in charge of the art. Um, so I found there was this guy that I followed, Mark Jarrell. He does awesome fantasy art. It's a lot of pen work, line work. That The first time I did art for the first version of The Dreaming City was like my attempt. I did that myself with pen and ink. Mm. And this guy kind of yeah. like draws the way I wish that that looked. <laughs> like So I've been a fan of his work. Um, so he was like the first person that came to mind. So I reached out to him. Uh, yeah. And he... I, again, I kind of just told him, do whatever you want. I gave him some sample tracks of what I've been working on, and he listened to it and just drew what he thought was best for it. And it was like the first thing he drew was, I was like, that's it. We're good. <laughs> you know, there was no back and forth. Um, mm. I just, it was, it was fun to have someone else interpret the music and to be able to use the art. And yeah. I think he knocked it out of the park. He does a lot of, uh, yeah. he does his own world building project with fantasy. It's called the, the, the mm. Cosmoteon. And it's really cool. He's starting to um, push more like the story. But if you go through his art, you'll see characters and places. And his his weapon work is cool too. He does a lot of cool fantasy weapons. So it's Mark Jarrell. 
if you want to find him. Cool. Send me any links that you've got to his absolutely, um, so his work, to his art station, whatever Excellent. he's got, and I'll stick it in the show notes. Well, it's um, it's it's great inspiration. This I've just read it for the first time. Um, I read about half of it a couple of months ago when yeah. we were talking about doing this the first time round, and I was taken aback at first just how incredibly relevant it felt. I mean, it's fifty three years old now. This book yeah. it was it was written in sixty nine. My edition is the nineteen seventy Mayflower edition with the excellent looks like it was knocked up from a couple of bits and pieces in a drawer. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a hardware store build. Yeah, yeah. It looks like yeah. a, per- perhaps the spare ship. It looks like it's I don't know. It could be either a lipstick or half of a <laughs> half of a felt tip pen with a couple of nails and the bottom part of a stapler glued yeah, to it. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's uh, it's very charming in its shoddiness. <laughs> this is the 1970 Mayflower edition when Mayflower, pre-Bob Herberfield, when yeah. Mayflower was still playing with photo covers. And I've got some marvellous Mayflower photo covers. Uh, but this is, a, this is a really nice one. It's very tidy condition as well. So, of course, I, f- I finished reading it and then I reread it again this afternoon in preparation. And it is quite unlike any of the mococks that I've been reading on my grand reread, because as you know, this podcast really is about reconnecting with lots and lots of books I read as a teenager, most of which I haven't read for over 30 years. And I had dim memories of this one, but I think it might have been wasted on 15-year-old me back in, I don't know, 1987 or whenever Yeah, there's a whole other tone to this book that he doesn't really hit. Yeah, Yeah. and it it reminds me in some ways of my experiences in the Third World War in that when he's writing something quite um, tough and contemporary in certain ways, there is language and there are references and certain vernacular in this book that I don't think I've ever seen in any other Michael Moorcock book that I can remember. Mm. For example, you know, instance of the word cunt, for example. I don't ever recall. I'm, I'm, yeah. It may well have occurred in other Moorcock books, but again, it's a long time ago. So that leapt out, and there are some sexual references in here that ground it much more. But of course, as we go into it, and actually somebody, strangely enough, I, I posted on Twitter an hour or so ago that we were talking about this and somebody popped up fairly quickly Jules popped up fairly quickly and said this is the one from memory that his wife Hilary Bailey wrote and um, and, it, and it got published under Mocock's name and with a little bit more back and forth and an intervention from Yochim Buzz, the dedication on the second or third page that says for Hilary who did more than help is a little clue as to the fact that there are large portions of this that are actually written by his wife Hilary Bailey. So that explains why I think this book certainly has... uh, The narrative has a voice, in inverted commas, that doesn't seem quite consistent with 1969 Moorcock. I think that makes it doubly interesting. Yeah, it does. What edition were you reading? Um, The uh, Mayflower with... Ah, yes. (laughs) I think that is the Herberfield, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's a couple of years down the line. Yeah, I also have a rather wonderful hardcover kicking around here somewhere but sods alone, you have I think you have the one with that uh abstract cover that's right that, yep that here one is incredible is. yeah this is the ace books edition yeah that the, covers that's my the, favorite <laughs> and, and that that actually reminds me very much and it's quite apt reminds me very much of a lot of the abstract paintings that have been done over the years that reflect mental health issues yeah absolutely and yeah. and then things like schizophrenia and it's entirely appropriate it's a fantastic cover but anyway let's get down into the book the story um I, i'm gonna read the the inner page and it says um i suppose this is the uh, back in those days when you opened a book and you had that little initial pull some pull quotes which would uh no pull quote isn't exactly the uh the right like a, like a uh, splash page yes yeah, <laughs> yeah 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 a pull quote is more like um don't leave this on Aunt Edna's chair, which is what you get <laughs> on the back of the fog. <laughs> um, so it says, I am lonely. A message from space. Ryan had been travelling alone through space for three years in constant radio contact with the Earth and accompanied only by the frozen living corpses of his wife, his children and other members of his family. Earth in the year 2000 had been a violent shambles, a planet where all mankind lived in fear of invasion, by alien bodies from space. 
where savage gangs called the Patriots revelled in aimless violence against anyone whom they, the purest of the pure, regarded as an alien. Fire and riots. Riots and fire. Ryan wanted to get away from it all. He wanted to found a new society in space. Cleaner, more decent, healthier, sane. On Earth it was the beginning of a new dark age. In space, the future beckoned. And that all sounds very laudable, Ryan. But frankly, Ryan, after reading the book, slightly less sympathetic. <laughs> it's, it's a good dupe, really. Like, yeah, it really pulls is. You in, like, oh, cool, what, this guy's, what's he up to? <laughs> yeah. He'll be Ryan. saving her. Yeah. Ryan, what a shit you are. <laughs> what an absolute shit. But yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to Ryan's depredations. Mm. So it's... um. We, we did The Winds of Gath not so long ago, another science fiction novel written probably within a couple of years of this with yeah. <clears throat> some of those features that we now take for granted, certainly from science fiction movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey and Alien, the idea of a, a ship deep in space with people in suspended animation. And what I really loved about this when I first kicked into it was this idea that this guy is awake, tending the ship, he's been awake for three years, He's on a, in, into a five-year journey. It's mundane. It's boring. He's terribly lonely. And essentially, he tries to mix up his days by mixing up his reports. Uh, I'll do the 2 o'clock report verbally, but the 10 p.m. one, I'll do it in writing. <laughs> it's like, holy yeah. shit, how crushingly boring must this man's existence be? The uh, madness that he's going through just by existing in this spaceship. There's a sound on the album I did. There's like a buzzing mechanical sound that I use yeah. throughout the album. That's the sound from my office at work. <laughs> and that's very intentionally why I use that sound. Because that yeah. sound is like, I don't even hear that sound anymore. It's constant and just yeah. ambient noise to me now. But yeah. if I record anything ever in my office, that's in the background. So I get very intentionally use that on this album because like to use that as like that's just, that's just the sound of the spaceship that he's in right that's yeah. that's all he hears because no one is with him so that's yeah. his mad that's like pulling at his madness so it was a very that's yeah. my madness that sound so i put it in the album as his madness yeah. It was, yeah yeah it's, it's, i feel his pain it's quite <laughs> it's quite easily identifiable isn't it if if you're in a, a mundane job of drudgery but when, when you think this you know it's three years into this journey and his family, his wife, his children, his brother-in-law, his sister-in-law, who he pervs over because he it was, was he or wasn't he having an affair with her. Yeah. Their uncle, the family friends. There's just him and a computer and a load of old Polish films. <laughs> and I think there's, one, there's a reference at one point to he watches some Patriot propaganda films about um, or, a, or a propaganda play about the uncovering of a Yorkshire resistance cell and uh, and dragging them out and, 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 and executing them. And it's like, ooh, it's a, a really terrible array of entertainment that he's got to keep him sane. And as we'll see, it doesn't really keep him sane at all, although there's perhaps a little bit more to his, to his mental health problems than simple boredom. But we get a flashback to... And again, this is quite mundane, and it's him and his wife moving into their new house, and it's kind of really a picture of, I suppose, not exactly pastoral bliss, but it establishes Mr. and Mrs. Ryan as a fairly normal couple. But then we get an additional flashback, and there's a gathering at his house, and this is where you start to get the sense that this world isn't quite going according to you know, a healthy script, and that they have these blinds and they can hear that things are going on outside. And oh, I think it's Uncle Sidney opens the blinds and there is a, a genuinely horrendous vista on display out in the streets where the Patriots, who I suppose, what would our modern analogue be for the Patriots? They're, it's, it's set in London and the Patriots are a movement of people who think that the foreign and the different and the non-English should be tracked down and maybe not just ejected from the country, but they see those these people as, as the root of all problems for England. 
and they see a man dragged and strapped to a board, a door, doused in petrol, and then set on fire, which is a, a truly horrific display of the mob. And it's uh, it's quite disturbing, actually, that. And there's also the realisation that every other, ha- every other apartment in the street, across the street, all the blinds are closed. There's a sense of fear, of paranoia, that if the crowd sees that the blinds are up, they'll be targeted. So it's plainly obvious that, despite the fact that we got this initial look at the mundanity of Mr and Mrs Ryan moving into the new apartment, actually the world is completely fucked at this point, and a desperately anti-other movement is becoming almost a disease in the country. Hmm. Strangely familiar. I don't know... I, I don't know about you, but we've we've had four or five years of this now. You know, we're not quite seeing people yeah, strapped yeah. strapped to doors and in, and you know set on fire. But the movement in this country, this all feels very close to the home. You know, it's it's quite quite close to the knuckle. Yeah, so, there's so many po- like you can do pull quotes from this book. Yeah, that just without context, you'd think it was. <laughs> A reference to something very recently that was happening on the news. It's really, yeah. It was like yeah. chilling to read in certain moments. <clears throat> yeah, and um, I've, I've picked a couple out and we'll look at them in a second. But back on the ship, we find that Ryan... Oh, actually, before we get to that, we find out that his friend James Henry is a massive prick. And that, that will come into play later on. He has two wives. He's an, un, an insufferable prick to both of them. And uh, it, James Henry's prickishness will reemerge a little bit further down the line. Back on the ship, the routine, we find that it's being punctured by not just nightmares, frequent nightmares, but also periods of reflection. And whilst he's reflecting, he's writing in his log, and he uses his log for all sorts of reflections, and he writes... When I look back to our days on Earth, particularly towards the end, I realise just how tense we were. The ship routine has relaxed me, allowed me to realise just what I had become. I don't like what I became. Perhaps one has to become a wolf, however, to fight wolves. It will never happen again. There were times, I cannot deny, when I lost hold of my ideals, even my senses. Some of the events are hazy. Some are almost completely forgotten though doubtless one of my relatives or friends will be able to remind me. I can hardly believe that it took such a short time for society to collapse. That was what caused the trauma, of course. The suddenness of it all. Obviously there were signs of the coming crises, and perhaps I should have taken more heed of these signs. But then all chaos suddenly broke loose throughout the world. What we tutted at, in the manner of older people, slightly disconcerted by the changing times, I now realise were much more serious indications of social unrest, sudden increases in population, decreases in food production. There were the old problems that the Jeremiah had been going on about for years, but they were suddenly with us. Perhaps we had been deliberately refusing to face the problem, just as people had refused to consider the possibility of war with Germany in the late thirties. We Homo sapiens have a great capacity for burying our heads in the sand whilst pretending to face out the issues, and there's always some bloody messiah to answer their needs. Someone whom they will follow blindly because they're too fearful to rely on their own good sense. It's like Don Quixote leading the Gadarene swine. Leaders, Führers, Duches, Prophets, Visionaries, Gurus. For a hundred years the world was run by bad poets. A good politician is only something of a visionary. Essentially, he must be a man who sees the needs of people in practical and immediate terms and tries to do something about it. Visionaries are fine for inspiring people, but they are the worst choice as leaders. They attempt to impose their rather simple visions on an extremely complicated world. Why have politics and art become so mixed up together in the last hundred years? Why have bad artists been given nations as canvases on which to paint their tatty, sketchy rubbish? Perhaps because politics, like religion before it, was dead an effective force, and something new had to be found, and art stood in until whatever it was turned up. Will something turn up? It's hard to say. We'll probably never know, on Munich 15040, if the world survives or not. Thank God we have the initiative to get the ship on her way to the stars. Quite pointed 
and poignant that. And it's it's interesting, I think, from today's perspective. I think when he wrote this, a lot of politicians were kind of intellectuals. Today's politicians, certainly in the UK, they are mediocre bankers who are being given a nation as their plaything to draw terrible petty pictures but this still stands up as being really vivid and it actually gets de- it gets developed a little bit later as well because of course from ryan's perspective he acknowledges here that his generation possibly should be doing more and probably they are a little bit too complacent about yeah. developments yeah. yeah the conversations he ends up having in those back to earth flashbacks yeah like around the office and with his co it really is like it's just fascinating to read. It's telling of, of their own, how he is carrying that, what he didn't do, what he could have done mm. as everything collapsed around him. It's just, it's, it's cool. Yeah. And of course, we, we find out by uh, another flashback about his job. He actually runs a toy factory, Ryan's Toys. And he has this issue, a, a broad issue, where he asks one of his sub, uh, subordinates, Masterton, to get him a list of employees with foreign connections and blood ties because he convinces himself when he's reflecting back on this that actually he's doing it for the right reasons he's doing it because he wants to protect these people but whilst he's saying the right things he's got this real hard on for an employee called powell who he's convinced is welsh and he others in inverted commas powell he others him at every possible opportunity so you've got this instant dichotomy of a guy who's behaving as the manager trying to look after his business because we find that the government which is the the nimoites are in power which is a curious a curious name for a faction and i actually looked this up earlier on because the only person who i could think of called nimmo who would have been around in the 60s was an actor called derek nimmo who played upper class twits and originally came from Liverpool. And I thought, I don't know, is, is, is Mocock or indeed Hilary Bailey, who apparently wrote, wrote these sections, are they postulating a year 2000 where Derek Nimmo goes into <laughs> politics? I don't know. But anyway, the Nimmoites are giving tax incentives to companies that only employ 100% English employees. So in this world, even Ireland, Scotland, Wales, they are considered to be not homeland They're considered to be other. And he considers himself a good employer. And he comments that he doesn't mind the kind of socialist patterns of employment benefits for people and the fact that the employees have a stake in the company. So it's not really dwelled upon this, but there's this idea that the Nimoites, despite the raging nationalism and the incentives for um, only employing English, not British, English workers, is perhaps coming from some kind of extreme left-wing government. And, and, and that kind of leapt off the page at me because not only is he saying on the one hand that actually he considers himself a good employer, he's quite happy if he has to get rid of foreigners to give them really good severance packages, but the recent wave of nationalism, particularly from the perspective of the patriots, means that he's got to balance his business priorities which all sounds, in some ways, like the kind of excuses that a, a high-level businessman would make, but it's all counterbalanced by the fact that he's being an absolute shit to this guy Powell and he's othering him for being Welsh. And I f- found that really well drawn as a picture of a guy who is getting drawn into really poor practices and really poor modes of thinking. Yeah, well, it's like you know, when, you're, when you're in the in the heart of, of the empire or the, like, hegemonic force you yeah. kind of are just doing your best to, to get by and like he's like convinced himself that no i'm doing i'm doing good by these people i'm doing it right yeah but it's like no you're still <laughs> succumbing to the the will of this this power that having you do horrible things but yeah he's being dragged into the the gravity of this this movement even when he's in businessman looking after his business mode he makes a comment that um or is, is there's like a thought that even once Masterson has brought me this list of employees, and I think it turns out to be 35% of his employees have either a Scottish, Welsh, Irish, American is mentioned. 
West Indian blood or descent or familial connections. He thinks, well, you know, I'll give him a really good severance package because I'm a really decent guy and it'll be a big hit on the company finances. But on the other hand, with the tax breaks that I'll get for taking people off the dole queue who are English and the fact I'll be able to pay them less, what means I'll probably recoup all that within a year. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, <laughs> absolutely amazing. But there's also a really telling comment as well about the inverted commas, the West Indians. He's talking to Masters and he says, oh, come off it, Fred. I just want to be prepared. In any case, any competitors will start going for us. Naturally, I'll protect my employees to the hilt. This is one way of making sure I can protect them against any scandal for a start. Masters and sighed. What about those with Negro blood? I mean, the West Indians got around a bit before they were all sent back. Okay. I don't think anybody's got anything against the blacks at the moment, have they? Not at the moment. Fine. But you never know. It's like, we're, we're only four years out from the Windrush scandal in the UK. I think it's been four years since the government started sending vans around with... This is when Theresa May was foreign secretary. Vans with signs on them threatening people that will be sent home and to go back to their own countries. And then people who've lived in the UK... West Indian people who lived in the UK since the 1950s, who were naturalised citizens, who were called the Windrush Generation, were getting deported. And it's like, you read this on this page, and it's like, right, okay, so in, in this world, the Windrush scandal wasn't a scandal, it was a successful deportation of all the West Indians. And it's again, it's, it's so close to the knuckle now. The other thing that really interested me about it was the idea that this perhaps is a left-wing version of a possible utop uh, dystopia because he's talking about you know the, so the he doesn't mind all the socialist benefits for the workforce and all this business <laughs> and it's quite unusual to get dystopias that result from uh, a left wing government it's usually right wing jackboots isn't it but it's only a couple of weeks ago it's a complete coincidence and i can't even remember how i came across it i was pointed at uh British TV show from about 1977 called 1990, starring Edward Woodward, or as we call him in these parts, Iwa Wuwa, because of a terrible joke at school, which was, why does Edward Woodward have so many D's in his name? The answer being, if he didn't, he'd be called Iwa Wuwa. So we know him, and I have known him for 40 years as Iwa Wuwa because of that. But Edward Woodward, the uh, star of The Wicker Man and The Equaliser, plays a journalist in a two season it ran for two seasons and it's a tv show set in britain in the year 1990 made in the 70s where an out of control unionist left-wing government has got to the point where skilled workers and people who felt that they were being unfairly punished by rampant unionism and low pay have all left the country and there's been a skills drain so now the country is not the country has basically border officials who are chasing people down, but they're not stopping them getting in. They're stopping them getting out. So you have these peculiar scenes where you have actors who are sneaking onto ships to try and get out of Britain and they're being dragged off the ships and beaten up by by uh, vicious border police who belong to this certain branch of the government. And we're stopping them getting out rather than getting in. And it's really interesting. It's it's kind of a, an almost hysterical depiction of some middle-class writer's worst fears about what happens if unions take over the government. <laughs> it's, re it's really quite fascinating. A little bit boring as well in that style that those 70s TV shows definitely tend to be. <laughs> but it's really hard to think of too many examples of the the dystopia resulting from, from a, an out-of-control left-wing government. I think probably V for Vendetta by Alan Moore, is one of the others. Because from memory, in V for Vendetta, the government results from a left-wing government and lots of climate change issues. And that's how the country ends up kind of responding to all of these problems and rampant unemployment and everything else. But yeah, it's certainly not something that's common in dystopian fiction, I don't think. I guess it's to the point that regardless of being it left or right, powers that be that are in charge will have to force their will <laughs> regardless of whether or not it's something you so sure maybe it's from a left-wing standpoint but the the enforcement of it and the the yeah, i guess the enforcement of it mm. <laughs> ends up feeling quite fascist anyway yeah. right because yeah that's just <laughs> that is how to control unfortunately or that is how 
governments will control, regardless of you know whether or not something's left or right wing is is I guess on your really at the end of the day whether or not you agree or disagree with it or whether you think it's radical or not. But there will always be people who do not agree on either side, and the people if the people have the power, they will force it on those who are disagreeing, and mm. that's when it will become oppression. Mm. So it's just constant. <laughs> Well, it's incredibly common, isn't it, in the yeah. world of Twitter dialogue or yeah. or Twitter arguments or uh, sadly these things are rarely debates, they're more like flame wars. Is flame mm. war still a still a thing? That was a, an old message <laughs> board. Is that message board language? Am I a bit out of date? Yeah. No, so, I, re- you- I mean, I remember that. There's, there's no, because there's no, and again, it's, you don't need to ha- necessarily have constructive discourse over everything with everyone, mm. but there's no room for it at all. Yeah. It's just, it's, this is the way it is. This is whatever, how everyone should think, believe, and be, and that's it. There's no. Yeah. And you do, you do get a, a lot of flame war kind of discourse, certainly in, in the Twitter sphere, where you do get people who are coming from the right calling left wing people or leftists fascists and say, no, that's fascism. And, yeah, it's you just know, pointing and, fingers. At, at... Yeah. I mean, ultimately, if, if boot boys are kicking faces in, in order to, to push some kind of agenda, it's uh, it's not good, is it? No matter which wing yeah. it's coming from. But anyway, so you got Ryan. He thinks he's a good man, but he's justifying these things to himself by, while simultaneously demonising a Welsh employee, and calculating how he can possibly make all these severance packages um, recoverable in terms of financial loss and and the uh, the tax incentives are the ways to do that. When they were observing the Patriot riot. Ryan at one point makes a comment that they should go along to one of these Patriot rallies just to get on the inside and see what it's all about. And they do indeed actually do that. And we find out and get a little bit more context about the Patriot movement and the MP, Member of Parliament, and the leader of the Patriots, Colin Beasley, what makes him tick and where he's coming from. So while they're in this crowd wondering about some of the dialogue that's being leveled because a lot of the paranoia even extends as far as the othering and the otherness of people who are ruining the country potentially even being space aliens and actually have, having come from out of space which is uh which is all very david ike but whilst he's giving his, his speech he says we cannot tell who they are yet they are among us they look like us sound like us in every respect they are human but they are not human They are non-human. They are anti-human. How, you say, do we know about the aliens? How have we found out about the existence of this pollution, of these creatures who move about our society, like cancer cells in a healthy body? We know by the evidence of our own eyes. We know the aliens exist because of who they are, what happens when they're about. Otherwise, how can we explain the existence of chaos, bloodlust, Law-breaking, riot, revolution in our midst. How can we explain the deaths of the little children, battered to death by the fanatics of Yorkshire? The satanic practices of religious maniacs in the Fens? The waves of rioting and looting all over the West Country? How can we explain the hatred and the suspicion, the murder rate, now three times what it was five years ago, a full ten times what it was in 1990? How can we explain the fact that we have so few children, when a few years ago the birth rate had doubled. Disaster is upon us. Who is staring up and fermenting all this disorder, bloodshed and ruin? Who are they? How do we find them? How? How indeed? You all know, in your heart of hearts, who they are. They are the men, and women too, make no mistake. There are women as well, who are different. You know them. You can tell them at a glance. They look different. Their eyes are different. They express doubt when you and I know certainty. They are the men who associate with strangers and people of doubtful character. The men and women who throw suspicion on what we are fighting for. They are the sceptics, the heretics, the mockers. When you meet them, they make you doubt everything, even yourself. They laugh a lot and smile too often. They attempt, by jesting, to throw a poor light on our ideals. They are the people who hang back when plans are suggested for purifying our land. They defend the objects of our patriotic anger. They hang back from duty. Many are drunkards, licentious scoffers. You know these people, friends. 
You know them, these men who have been sent here to undermine a righteous society. You have always known them. Now is the time to pluck them out and deal with them as they deserve. Ooh. And of it's course like Eric pro- Clapton. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. The cloud, sorry, the crowd, the crowd, probably all Clapton fans, absolutely love it. The crowd love it. And again, it's it's really, really well written and well constructed. That well, it, it, it's funny to to like the the rhetoric of fascist pricks never changes, right? I yeah. mean, <laughs> like that's that's the unfortunate truth, and why it's so resonant now is because this is the same shit that is spouted by them today. Like, yeah. You've got it at your end. We've got it at our end. We are and round about the time this was written. This is written only a year after the British MP Enoch Powell had given his Rivers of Blood speech. So whilst this was really current in 1969, I think in the intervening years, perhaps a little bit of this, whilst being still really poignant and uh, disturbing fades a little bit, We've gone full circle in 50 years, and we're back there again. And I'm not going to mention the name of these fuckers, but we've got people in the UK pointing at migrant boats and and othering them and saying, we can't take them, they bring crime, or they're rapists, or, um, you know, I mean, but by the definitions that Beasley gives there, and it is Beasley, isn't it? Yeah, Beasley. Oh, name identification with Bishop Beasley out of the Jerry Cornelius novels. Yeah. I wonder if Bishop Beasley's name was Cyril as well. But anyway, yeah, it's it's all, again, it's really close to the bone. Again, right now. And this is why I think this book really is probably more relevant than it's been it's probably since it was written. It was very relevant at the time, being a year after Enoch Powell's speech. But yeah, this is um, this is really... As a book, it's great stuff, but actually as as a as a a warning, which all good science fiction should <laughs> be. It wasn't meant to be relevant so many years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure that they probably when they wrote this hoped that perhaps we might have made some progress. Yeah. Yeah. But it feels relevant, it feels contemporary. And James Henry, his friend, being a massive prick. <laughs> He's he's all into it, and he's he's frothing at the mouth, saying, "Yeah, let's get them foreigners, let's get them aliens, let's get them others." So Ryan has to think fast to get him out of a sticky spot, and he works on Henry a little bit. At, at the time when I read this, I thought it was he was kind of bending his own perspective to try and pacify James Henry. But once you read further into the book, you actually think actually Ryan is a massive prick himself. He's just yeah, you know, yeah. There's that moment because. You know, confronting yourself, like if you have a friend who's like, you're kind of like, oh, why did, why did he just say that weird thing around me? Like, maybe I'll try and, you know, <laughs> you like explore that. And maybe you accidentally convince yourself, like you, you don't take a hard stance against what this mm-hmm. person that you are friends with said. So mm-hmm. you like almost belittle your own anti-opinion by yes. <laughs> by trying to cater to them, to try and talk to them about it. And then it just... You by not just firmly standing up, being like, "No, you're wrong. That's what you said is horrible." Like you're sacrificing yeah. your own ideals then in that moment, and then that's already having them win a little bit of like sort of yeah. ceding any power to someone who thinks that way. It's it's like what yeah. he was going through with this of like, yeah, you're absolutely right. And when I was reading this bit, I was actually thinking back to before the Brexit vote and when that campaign was going on and sitting in the pub with two very dear friends and trying to have a rational conversation and very, very quickly having one of them wagging his finger in my face and being, to me, extraordinarily unreasonable. And it's someone I've been been friends with since I was 17. I'm now 50, you know? And in, in those moments, the easy thing to do is just to shrug and go, all right, we'll just have to agree to disagree. Yeah. Which is probably what we did at the mm-hmm. time. But, yeah, it's it's um, it does feel like some kind of capitulation, you know? 
especially five years down the line or however many years it is down the line and looking back what a fucking mess it all is but yeah right ryan uses quite a, a, a clever argument with james to say that it could be aliens in the patriots fermenting this in order to destabilize us which is you know prob- that's quite a good move to settle james down and stop him frothing at the mouth and James, and he says, uh, the Patriots, hmm, I suppose it's just possible. Ryan handed him his drink. I thought, he said, that the discoveries in space would give us all a better perspective. Instead, it seems that the perspective has been even more narrowed and distorted. Once people only feared other races, other nations, other groups with opposed or different interests. Now they fear everything. It's gone too far. I'm still not with you, James Henry said. Simply paranoia. What is paranoia, Henry? Being afraid of things, suspecting plots, all that stuff. It can be defined more closely. It's an irrational fear, an irrational suspicion. Often it's in fact a refusal to face the real cause of one's anxieties, to invent causes because the true cause is either too disturbing, too frightening, too horrible to face, or too difficult to cope with. That's what paranoia actually is, Henry. So the Patriots have offered us a surrogate. They've offered us something to concentrate on that is nothing really to do with the true causes of the ills of society. It's common enough. Hitler supplied it to the Germans in the form of the Jews and the Bolsheviks. McCarthy supplied it to the Americans in the form of the Communist Conspiracy. Even our own Enoch Powell supplied it in the form of the West Indian immigrants in the 60s and 70s. There are plenty of examples. James Henry frowned. You say they were wrong, eh? Well, I'm not so sure. We were right to get rid of the West Indians when we did. We were right to restrict jobs to Englishmen when we did. You have to draw the line somewhere, Ryan. Ryan sighed. And what about these aliens from space, then? Where do they fit in? What are they doing to the economy? They're an invention, a crude invention at that, of the Patriots, to describe anyone who is opposed to their insane schemes. Where do you think the term witch hunt comes from, Henry? James Henry sipped his drink thoughtfully. Perhaps I did get a bit overexcited. Ryan patted him on the shoulder. We all are. It's the strain, the tension, and it's particularly the uncertainty. We don't know where we're going. We've no goals because we can't rely on society any longer. The Patriots offer certainty, and that's what we've got to find for ourselves. You better explain, John Ryan said from his chair. Have you got any suggestions? Ryan spread his hands. That was my suggestion, that we find a goal. A rational goal. Find a way out of this mess. And of course we find out, well we know that their way out of this mess is to jump on a spaceship and fly to another planet five years away. Yeah. And, and leave the wrong person in charge. Yeah, yeah. I, but you know, I've got to say, again, identifiable to a degree. There are certainly times at the moment when I see what's going on with the politics of this country that I'd like to pull an eject seat card. But yeah. Meanwhile aboard the ship, Ryan is continuing to exist. He's talking to the computer about his depression and loneliness. He even considers waking his brother up just so he's got an exercise partner. Or waking his brother's wife up, Janet, so he can continue his affair. There's a a really interesting part where we're getting insight into Mrs. Ryan's pretty desperate and miserable experience back on Earth, where essentially she gets up in the morning, she compulsively cleans, then Uncle Sidney rings up and says, will you come and visit me? And she says, no, you come here. And he says, I'm not going out on my own. Then she takes a sleeping pill at 11 o'clock, has some crazy dreams, wakes up, does some more cleaning, gets paranoid about the woman next door, goes back to bed, has a nightmare, rinse and repeat, and that is basically her existence, which sounds incredibly miserable. It's like some kind of 70s sitcom wife who just does the cleaning till half past 10 in the morning then sits and drinks wine all day. Although I must say, there are, in some ways... I'd quite like to get made redundant and do that for a couple of months. I could watch Judge Judy. I've been made redundant before. I could watch Judge Judy for a couple of months, I'm sure. Yeah. But no, if that's your existence, that's pretty miserable. And back on the ship, Ryan is still having nightmares and there's some evidence that he's just starting to lose it. Or certainly that the computer is struggling with his comms because he finds a message on the computer and the computer says, I cannot process this message. And the message says, triumphant in the bloody sky and the human form is no more. And Ryan has to scratch his head and think, yeah, not entirely sure what this means, but I must have written it because there's nobody else around. 
and fair play to the computer, I wouldn't know what to do with that either. <laughs> but again, another flashback to his office, and this is at a point where the Patriots have taken control and appear to have driven the Nimoites out of London, and the Nimoite cabinet has retreated to Birmingham. So this old government is in exile in Birmingham, and Birmingham <laughs> is now at war with London. And a minister visits and is veiled because it's now the policy of the civil service that all senior civil servants must only travel in public in veils so nobody can identify them. And is visiting the toy factory because essentially the world is now absolutely unravelling. And Ryan's toy factory has been retasked and put on war footing. The minister is essentially saying that you need to up your game because you're not producing enough and you're not producing fast enough. And after the official leaves, he says he wondered how things were in the rest of the world. Very few reports came through these days. The United States were now disunited and at war. United Europe had fragmented into thousands of tiny principalities, rather as England had. As for Russia and the Far East, the only information he had had for months was that a horde thousands of times greater than the Golden Horde was sweeping in all directions. Possibly none of the information was true. He hoped that the town of Surga on the Siberian plain was still untouched. Everything depended on that. So that's our first indication, actually, that this plan that they have involves somehow getting to Siberia. And we find out a little bit later how that goes down. So the world is fucked. And there's also a reference to three nuclear devices, three hydrogen bombs being dropped on England as well. So things are seriously starting to unravel. This is all like uh, one of those vignettes you get in the later Jerry Cornelius novels as well, or it's like one of the scenarios in my experiences in the Third World War, where the world is unraveling and nukes are dropping yeah. in various it, places. There's such a excellent, like, fragmented world building that you have to put together as yeah. you read it. It's so well done in this book. It's Yeah, it's fantastic. It really, it's, ju it's just littered with little, yeah, it, little it tiny like references. It would be prime for, like, a, a Christopher Nolan type <laughs> to like adapt and not explain any clearer just present it similarly like just you know do your own work and figure out what's going on <laughs> yeah kind of. Th there's a really good movie in this book yeah yeah a really good movie and it would be a terrible movie if someone took this story and just pieced everything together and explained what's happening you know what i mean like part of part of the puzzle yeah is figuring that out and and part of the enjoyment yeah. I, I got out of reading it I mean, yeah. I read it a few times in a row. It's definitely worth revisiting because then you pick up more. You get it's a good, yeah, it's a good but one there, for that. There are little concepts in here that have popped up in films, um, done not particularly well, I don't think. But um, funnily enough, in one of the earliest references to him visiting the hibernation room, he's looking at a monitor while he's monitoring the life signs of of his family who are in suspended animation, and one of them says dreams. As if there's somewhere that that can be access to their dreams. Yeah. Thinking but, Prometheus, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. I totally thought that. Yeah. Yeah. It's never, yeah. but it's ne it's never revisited. No. Nope. And <laughs> it's it's just a throwaway line, but it's never revisited. But yeah, in Prometheus, that's exactly what. Oh, what's David? David is doing. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if you saw. It wasn't a good film, but there was a film a few years ago called Passengers. I think. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, with um, Jennifer Lawrence mm -hmm. and um, Star Lord, it was an interesting, conceptually interesting, and seventy percent well done. In that you've got this huge—I don't know if it's a generation ship, but you've got this huge ship with a huge population all in suspending animation, and an accident makes one suspending animation pod release its occupant, and he finds himself alone on this ship still maybe a hundred years away from the destination and he can't get back into hypersleep so he's just awake on this ship on his own and he makes the decision because he i can't remember exactly why he makes the decision but i think he's got the hots for the jennifer lawrence character so he releases her from suspended animation but makes up a lie as to why she's woken up and then essentially lies to her as they're trying how he tries to forge a relationship with her and avoid the guilt of having woken her up and and it's a really interesting concept. It's quite well done. It's quite well shot. There are some really good scenes in it, but the ending is such a massive fucking cop out. <laughs> it really, really, really lets itself down. And you definitely get the sense that the original ending may have been different 
but either audience test reactions or studio pressure made them give it a, a, a more positive ending. Because there was, if that film had been made in the 70s, there's a very definite ending that film would have had, and it would have been good. It I always felt that way. Um, do you remember Pandorum? Yes. Similarly, I, I had the same opinion on that. I think it was so well made. There's something about the ending. It just wrapped it up so nice. It just didn't feel right at all. Yeah. Was like an, an, and also just the same concept of colony ship. Someone wakes up, not supposed to be awake. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a trope now, but yeah. when it's well done, I, it's one of those tropes that I'll, I'll visit. Yeah. Oh, I've got time. to say, <laughs> I, I really, really like Pandorum. Uh, that movie is fantastic. It's just, yeah. there's something about this, that just the last five minutes, just, I don't want to see him. Yeah. wake up all happy and everyone's yeah know. it does rattle to a, a, a close but you know you, you could you could make the argument that ryan and this is suffering from pandorum because pandorum's the name of the space deep space psychosis <clears throat> yeah isn't it? and the guy who made pandorum french guy french director mm-hmm. writer mocock's massively popular in france who knows you know the the concept for the core concept for Pandora may have come from this book. I'd like yeah. to think it did, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like Pandora. Obviously, you've got the introduction of crazy mutants, <laughs> which is which is always good fun. But I really like the cast. Probably the last uh, really great thing Dennis Quaid did. That that concept of them evolving stuck on the show that was just so cool. <laughs> the way that, the way that whole story played out was just yeah. it's awesome. That's great sci fi nonsense that I call it. Like that's like my ideal kind of like mm. story. Yeah, and I know these these directors always say this. Oh, it was first in a planned trilogy. Yep, um, yep. This is one of those. <laughs> yeah, but I think it is. I don't think that guy's made a movie since. I can't remember. I I think he had done other things that I enjoyed as well. I just I can't think of his name right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up later. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears> because it's probably 15 years ago. I looked him up on the internet and saw that he hadn't done anything else. He's had probably another 15 years to do something else. But yeah, I really like that film. In fact, might watch that later. Might, have, might might watch that later as my last act before of my two week holiday before I go back to work. Because funnily enough, we have been on a bit of a, a, a retro sci fi kick. Well, I say retro. It's not that retro when it's only twelve or thirteen years old. But I've, <laughs> I've got a, I've got a real soft spot for the Chronicles of Riddick as well. Oh yeah, yeah. So I just rewatched Pitch Black recently. <laughs> funnily enough, we watched it last night. Oh yeah, yeah. We we watched them in the wrong order because when we got back from Wales last week, I said I don't know why. But I really fancy watching Chronicles of Riddick. So we watched that. Then the following night, we watched Riddick. And last night, we thought, well, we might as well complete the triptych. So, so we watched Pitch Black again. And uh, I fucking love those movies. Uh, yeah. I think, I think so, you know, even though I don't think, I don't think Vin Diesel is a particularly <laughs> great actor or anything like that. And no. I, I'm not a fan of the Fast and Furious films, which is the reason why he hadn't done a fourth Riddick film. That's the only reason why that's probably a good reason to hate the fast and furious films but he really works in those movies he works brilliantly well in those movies yeah. and and for movies that weren't horrendously expensive the design work is fantastic the cinematography is fantastic and what they got bang for buck wise out of what they spent on the special effects the, yeah, especially just, going back to the, the pitch black you know yeah the very first one the, those special effects they're they're dated but they hold up well like it works in mm. the world like it's yeah. It's especially for movies made at that time. You don't see that that often when you go back and you visit it. The special effects look horrendous now. <laughs> like, but mm. that one held on. It, it looks good still. Yeah, I think if your visual design is good, you can get away with less than stellar special effects. Mm-hmm. And the visual design in those films is absolutely fantastic. The production yeah. design, everything about them, but also really great cinematography. Everything's beautifully lit. Yeah, good stuff. But anyway, yeah, yeah. off on a slight diversion there. <laughs> The world is completely unraveling, and as it happens, back on the ship, he appears to be starting to unravel as well. More mysterious log entries. He starts to think he's hearing footsteps. He starts to think he's hearing the voices of the people. He, confi- he confides in the computer, and its suggestion is ICC Proditol, which is uh, an apparent neuroleptic which will suppress the hallucinations. So whoever designed this ship, and we'll find out who that is later on, Whoever designed the ship and stocked it were prepared for the possibility of some kind of deep space psychosis. But before he takes it, he goes pretty much balls deep into a mega hallucination trip and freaks out. And he wakes up a little bit later to find the empty ampule of Prodital by his side. 
And he thinks, well, I must have had the wherewithal, despite the fact that I was hallucinating so heavily, to actually take it. But he also finds that the ship's woken his brother up to deal with the medical emergency. I found it amusing that Ryan's first thought really was, shame it wasn't Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Why could the computer wake Janet up? That'd be much better. He takes to his bed for a couple of days. But while he's there, he reflects on his first affair with Sarah, the daughter of Carlson a rival toy maker who was deeply involved in the Patriot movement, but fell out of favour after he went a little bit too far with his conspiracy theories and became a hollow earther. (laughs) So there's some more great world building here, but it takes a really, really, really dark turn because Sarah explains that she doesn't want to see him anymore and she doesn't want to continue the affair for one reason or another, but she needs him to drive her home. And... She says, we need to avoid the anti-fem zone. And it turns out that the area around Balham and Clapham is run by the anti-fems gang. And any woman who's found there is murdered, which is pretty brutal. And at first you think, well, that's a really, again, interesting piece of dystopian kind of Mad Max world building about how far London has fallen. But actually, we find out that not quite how much of a shit Ryan is, but a fair percentage of how much yeah, of shit. confirmation of <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So after Sarah's explained that she doesn't, or she isn't able to see him anymore, he lets slip, as they're talking about the state of the world, that he's been working on a way out. And she's essentially disgusted by him. Because to some degree they've had this, um, this relationship where he's been kind of a sugar daddy because he's a lot older than her. And she really goes to town on him. She calls him out on his generation's failure to head off the calamities that are consuming the world through their selfishness and myopia. And again, it comes back to this theme of of the generation that could have resolved this actually due to greed and complacency and essentially being bought off have allowed this world to degenerate to this point. So he's a bit pissed off about this on a couple of counts. So how does he respond? He kicks her out the car in fucking Balham. And within seconds, she's dead and her head's on a spike. It's brutal. It's terrible. It's absolutely brutal. So all of a sudden, it's like, holy shit, Ryan is in fact a fucking monster. And back aboard the ship after he's he's, he's, he's thinking about this. And John's in control of the ship. So he takes to his bed and he reflects on Sarah. And he reflects on it, as usual, by writing it in his log. And he writes... What I did to Sarah can be justified, of course, and that she could have ruined this project. I had to be sure nothing wrecked it. The fact that we are all safe and aboard is evidence that I took the right precautions, trusting no one outside the group, making sure that everything was done with the utmost secrecy. We kept contact only with the Russian group, about the last outpost of rational humanity that we knew about. Would I have done it in that way if she had not turned me down in such an unpleasant manner? I don't know. Considering the state of things at the time, I behaved no worse, no less humanely than anyone else. You had to fight fire with fire, and if it, and certain other things, is on my conscience, at least it isn't on anyone else's conscience. The boys are clean. So is Josephine. So are most of the others. And that thing there, would I have done it in that way if she had not turned me down in such an unpleasant manner? It punished her for being non-compliant with his sexual urges. It's absolutely, it's outrageous. It's appalling. And it continues a little bit further. But it's still, yeah. After all this time of self-reflection, he's still questioning. Eh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it's, he's still kind of like... It's he, absolutely incredible. Yeah. So, Mocock or Hillary Bailey, which everyone wrote, absolutely nails the absolute lack of self-awareness and yeah. the lack of true shame and the mental gymnastics that perpetrators undertake to absolve themselves. And we got a lot of that in one of the stories in my experiences in the Third World War, where the narrator is sleeping with a teenage prostitute who's probably underage, and he he justifies it to himself in all sorts of ways that perpetrators do. And we've got that here as well. And he writes, There's no doubt about it, I have blood on my hands. That's probably the reason I've been having bad dreams. Any normal halfway decent man would. I took it upon myself to do it. At least, I didn't involve anyone else. When we hijacked the Albion transport, I had hoped there would be no doubt. Neither would there have been, I think, if the crew had all been English. Incredible. I always knew the Irish were excitable, 
but that that stupid fellow who tried to get the gun from me in mid-air deserved all he got. He must have been Irish. There's no other explanation. I was never a racialist, but one had to admit that there were certain virtues the English have which other races don't share. I suppose that is racialism, of a sort, but not the unhealthy sort. I was horrified when I heard that the foreigners in the camps were being starved to death. I would have done something about it, if I could, but by that time it had gone too far. Maybe Sarah was right, maybe I could have stopped it if I hadn't been so selfish. I always considered myself to be an enlightened man. A liberal man. I was known for it. The rot had set in before my day. H-bombs, nuclear radiation, chemical poisoning, insufficient birth control, mismanaged economics, misguided political theories, and then panic. And no room for error. Throw a spanner in the works of a society as sophisticated and highly tuned as ours and... That's all. Chaos. They tried to bring simple answers to complicated problems. They looked for messiahs when they should have been looking at the problems. Humanity's old trouble. But this time humanity did for itself. Absolutely. What an absolute shit. It's so, go washing ahead. his hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just fucking horrible. Absolving himself of any yeah. guilt just by any halfway decent man would react in this way. It's, uh, it's incredible. But it's so well written, and it makes me absolutely detest him all the more. And if mm. anything, it only gets worse. <laughs> it's, it's got further to go, yeah. The, the way, I mean, the way it ramps up in the last, I think it's like what, by page, like, I don't know, in the version I have, like, by page 95 is when you get your confirmation of him being a shit. Yeah. And then the book's over by, like, 120. And it's That's just right. from, in between those two, it's just, you hate him more and more, and he gets worse and worse, and it's just, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it turns out the Albion transport the hijacked was about to go and bomb Dublin. Yeah. So, so at least he headed that off, I suppose. <laughs> right. Pat him on the back. Good for him. Yeah, yeah. But but his monstrous behaviour does continue because when they arrive at the Russian destination, he's already referred to the pilot getting shirty and he kills him, justifying it to himself by insisting that because the pilot behaved in this way, he must have been Irish. You know. So it's, once again, he's is committing a terrible crime, but he's othering the person. Yeah he is perpetrating against. And then once his family are off the transport, he executes the rest of the crew as well, because he thinks it's the right thing to do. And at this point, you know something else is coming, because at the Russian base, the base personnel, there are 11 scientists, a couple of Russians, a couple of Americans, an Italian, some others, and you think, well, hang on a minute, they were in the suspended animation chamber at the beginning of this story. They've never been referenced once <laughs> throughout this entire process. So what's coming now? Well, the Italian scientist fancies Janet, so his cards are marked straight away. And the foreboding is quickly confirmed via Ryan's log. And to cut a long story short, he murdered them all brutally. <laughs> and the family helped him push the corpses out of the airlock. <laughs> it's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this, this guy, and by extension, his family, are a bunch of monsters. Back aboard the ship, Janet's awake. Or is she? And... The rest of this book, the, the, the last three or four chapters, is essentially him having a massive psychotic breakdown. He's hallucinating rampantly. We don't know whether John ever awoke in the first place. Everything beyond that initial hallucination rampage where the computer suggested Prodotol to him has probably all been part of his psychotic breakdown, his psychotic episode. And... Whilst the book ends with him apparently getting back on an even keel, it's an open-ended ending, and the loneliness of space travel and the enormity of his crimes have essentially destroyed his mental and emotional functioning. And that's essentially the book. It's pretty grim. <laughs> yeah. Did you watch Arrested Development? No. Okay. In, in that show, there's a character... <clears throat> named Job, played by Will Arnett. But in one of the later seasons, there's a situation where he gets in where he does something terrible and he goes to Rufi himself. So he takes, he calls him like forget me nots or something yeah. um, to forget that he had done it. But he, he like had waited too long between the horrible thing he'd done and taking the um, Rufi. So all he was forgetting was that he took a Rufi. So like he loses like a six week chunk of his life by constantly taking roofies to forget the horrible thing he had done. Right. Cause he, <laughs> and I feel like that's what this book is about. Like he has just been repeatedly injecting himself with Protol. Yeah. ODing 
on the verge of death and then bringing himself back, forgetting everything that happened because he had taken that drug so much. And that's just what his life has been, alone yeah. on the spaceship. Yeah. And of course, there is a reference. When the computer first references Prototol, yeah. it says you shouldn't take it beyond 14 days. Yeah. Whereas what we actually find in the last couple of chapters where he's just trapped in this cycle of madness is he's just shooting up Prototol like it's going out of fashion. Right. And I think this is just what he regularly does. This All yeah. this book is is like a little snippet of what his entire life since he's taken off has been mm. and will continue to be until he's just going to drop dead. That's yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. I was really taken aback by how gripped I was by this, you know, for all the reasons we've discussed. But since I've been on my, Mo my Grand Mocock reread for the last couple of years, which I must say hasn't been as heavy or intensive as it really should have been, considering I'm doing a podcast about Mocockish things. I'm, I'm, I'm dredging through them pretty fucking slowly, <laughs> if I'm honest. But I think this has been my favourite Mocock reread since I started. I've done 45, 46 episodes now. I know they've not all been about specifically about Mocock books. But this one, to me, had more moments, more holy shit moments in terms of yeah. the characterization. I just thought it was brilliant. Yeah, it's I th that fractured narrative really yeah. makes yeah. a huge difference. Yeah. And, and the depictions of of the paranoia and the hallucinations and the way in which somebody justifies their own actions to themselves, I think it's all brilliant. I think it's fantastic. Also, I like how it doesn't um, rely on the unreliable narrator trope. Yes. Like, as we're reading, you're, we're, as the reader, you're seeing that he's wrong. You're seeing yeah. the problems with what he's doing. It's not, it's not one of those books where... The twist is, oh, the narrator was convincing them. Like, both you, the reader, and the character have been misled or misleading. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have that. It's just you're watching it unfold as the horrible, like, yeah. there's no question as to whether or not that's happening. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's completely raw. Yeah. It's completely raw. And Mocock did go on and do really successfully unreliable narrator shtick with the Pyatt novels, which I think were brilliant and really well done but this is absolutely raw in the same way that again I've, I've, might be the third time i've referenced it the the three car stories in my experiences in the third world war mm -hmm. where it's a, about an individual their internal dialogue essentially justifying their actions and and getting them through what they're doing no matter how horrific and monstrous they may appear to the people who are, are listening to their internal monologue yeah, right. and, I, and I think in that in that respect, I think it's a massively successful book. You're watching the character go through that, but yeah. the book isn't trying to convince you as the reader that no. that makes what they are doing okay. No, it's not. It's not. just exploring this part of their psyche. It's yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. And the fact it does it all in well, if you discount the publisher pages and the copyright and everything else, does it all in about 118 pages. I think yeah. is you know incredible. And probably four or five of those pages are taken up with the, um, when he plays with text. Yeah, I love those. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which which is something we 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 haven't mentioned, but they're really cool as well. The way he plays with text in in certain elements. So yeah, absolutely fantastic book, fantastic fodder for music and for your album, which is also terrific. So what's next on your massive album ladder, your your future projection? Um. Big plans, uh, like goal. I want to do another three part, three like hour long song or 40 minute song trilogy. I want to do it on dancers at the end of time. Um, so I'm going to do it in the same way that I had, I had done a, a three part cycle on, um, with revelation space. Mm -hmm. And I used, uh, Berlioz Requiem. I chose three movements from that and I sort of like covered, his music and then wrote my own music for each each song yeah i want to do that i have to choose uh, right now it's like i'm either going to use um dvorak or gustav holtz <laughs> but i haven't decided yet but when i choose like the classical piece i want uh, the what i want to use then i'll start writing that out but that's going to be like down the line um mm. i'm already i i'm working on an album now that's I think it might end up being it's one of those situations where i'm, I'm writing the music and i have to see what where it's going what what world it brings me to when I listen to like the fragments mm. I have, but it's it's probably gonna end up being something much more modern, which I haven't done too much. Um, besides Brandon Sanderson, I haven't done too much modern mm. um, sci-fi or fantasy 
uh, Alistair Reynolds too, but I, I want to expand a little bit. So hmm. I might do something a little more like pulpy, like, uh, you know, it might end up being a red rising. Did you read those books? The Pierce yeah. Brown. Um, those are fun. Or it might be the, um, uh, the, the Gideon, Gideon, the ninth, Howard, the ninth. Have you read any of those? No, I, heard I, of those. I, I still have the revelation space books, the Alistair Reynolds books. Mm-hmm. Oh no, it's revelation space, Alistair Reynolds or Peter yeah. Hamilton. No, it's but, yeah, Alistair. Alistair Reynolds. I've still got four Alistair Reynolds books piled up in my to read pile near my bed <laughs> yeah. from from when we talked about your Alistair Reynolds stuff last time, your Revelation yeah, yeah. Space stuff last time, and I just not got around to it. But they're there, waiting, waiting the moment. Yeah. You got you got to get in there. Yeah, <laughs> but that time will come. But yeah, well, you know what? It's been great to have you on again. And just for everybody's benefit, once again, where can they find the Black Corridor? You're on Bandcamp. Yep, uh, Bandcamp is but the has everything that I've done. Um, I'm on Spotify and, and Apple Music and Amazon. Yep, whatever major Deezer. Yeah, all those. Um, but I think I don't necessarily put everything out on streaming, so mm. I keep it all on Bandcamp though. Because yeah. sometimes it's just not worth it. I do a lot of like 40 minute songs that you yeah. don't. People don't use those streaming services for that kind of a... Yeah, and besides, <laughs> streaming services don't buy your gear, do they? So I would suggest everybody visit the Imria page on Bandcamp. So I am double R Y R. I got that right, didn't I? Imria at band- on Bandcamp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and not only that, but your discography is always up at an incredible knockdown bargain price. So I wouldn't suggest to people... Just go and buy the Black Corridor. I would suggest people go and bag the entire Imria discography. Yeah, I try to keep it. I never want it to be more than twenty bucks for everything because I put out music so frequently. I, I like. I don't want. <laughs> I feel bad. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, the whole discography will always be around twenty bucks, regardless of how many. Right now, it's at an absolute 20, bargain. Twenty-four mm. releases. I think yeah. it's yeah. And that's the other, that's the word of one I was going to give people. Prepare for your, if you do buy the discography, prepare for your Bandcamp feed to be dominated and kicked <laughs> into submission by 24 odd titles coming to the top of your feed. Yeah. But no, brilliant to have you on as ever. Yeah. And uh, look forward to hooking up with you again in the future when we think of something else. Yeah, that's great. It would be lovely Thank to you. have you back on. And I must say, now that um, we've done the Black Corridor, I now have a real urge to dive back into some of the more disconnected Moorcock sci-fi novels from the 60s and see what other treasures I may have forgotten about. Yeah, there's got to be some other in there. Mm, mm. So I'm thinking The Sundered Worlds, The Blood Red Game. Um, Yeah, I'll have a look. The Distant Suns, maybe. Yeah, anyway, I'm going to have a hunt around and see what I can find. All right, great to talk to you. All right, thanks, man. So, just as Derek went down in the lift to the department store, who pops out the other lift? Well, it's only Graham. Welcome back to Derry and Tom's, Graham. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's going very well. And uh, I, I probably should also point out, we're not really in Derry and Tom's. We're in virtual Derry and Tom's. Because actually, you're in a caravan in the woods, like some weird 1970s Grampian TV, spooky kids folk horror TV show. But, yeah, that is right. I'm in a, a small camper van, <laughs> a, uh, a Japanese RV, as it were. Uh, Toyota Diner, it's very nice, actually. Um, uh. But yeah, in the in the middle of the woods at... Um, but my in-laws, I'm technically homeless at the moment, my, <laughs> but, but all is good. So how is it, how long until the actual move? Well, now the um, the house sale fell through, so we've sold our house, and we have nowhere to move to. So uh, it's it's um, we're kind of in limbo at the moment. But there is there's a few possibilities, and I think we've we've got quite accustomed to being in the middle of nowhere. So hmm. we might carry on it and build something in the woods or something i don't know i don't oh, know what we're gonna do but. that sounds great and it must be great for the other half because whenever you misbehave she can banish you to the camper van <laughs> exactly you know what, I feel i'd love that yeah and i can just drive off as well so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course because it's a camper van not a caravan yeah, yeah i think sadly if if that was to happen to us phil would ensure it was a caravan yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway we're here to talk about the black corridor so, of course, I've just um, covered the Black Corridor and unpacked it a little bit with Derek, which was a, a really good, enlightening conversation. Of course, Derek has just 
I said just because he's a machine. Since he released the Black Corridor, he's released three more albums, yeah. um, including the, the Dreaming City Part Three with guest artists Sonus and uh, the Gateless Gate, oh, which I've amazing. just been given a listen to actually for the first time properly, and it's smashing. Yeah, it's that does proper. Sound good. There's some really proper like psychedelic progtastic stuff going on on that third version of the Dreaming City, so well worth checking out. But a while back, probably last year now. You actually did an album based upon The Black Corridor with a little bit of assistance from our common mucker, Wayne. So you're well invested in The Black Corridor yourself. Yeah, so I remember I remember reading The Black Corridor in, in, when I was a teenager. And at the same time, I read, or similar time, Tiger Tiger by, I forget the author's name. Um, but in my mind, they just got blurred together. Yeah. So then I I recently, well, I say recently, about a year ago, reread The Black Corridor. And um, yeah, it was, I don't think I got enough from it when I read it as a teenager, but it seemed, mm-hmm. now, now I'm older, it seems a lot more relevant to, to me now. And historically, a lot of stuff is happening now that The Black Corridor kind of covers. Yeah. Tiger Tiger, of course, was Alfred Bester, wasn't it? That's right. That's right. I, re- I read, read a little bit of Bester. As a teenager, because Pops gave me a couple of best of novels. Um, but I've never read Tiger, Tiger. Um, but yeah, The Black Corridor. Um, I, when, when I was on holiday, week before last, we went off to Wales. And I took The Sheep Look Up with me by John Brunner. And despite the fact I had to abandon it, because the edition I had, the print was so terrible and so small and on some pages didn't seem to have stuck properly as if it was i mean it's a it's a 19 I think early 80s edition but it was almost yeah. like it was printed by a printer that was running out of ink <laughs> um the the type was offset so badly on the right hand pages the print was almost infringing upon the binding and I, I just I just had to give up because it was destroying my eyes. And it was even worse when we'd been out for a few and had some wine and I was going back <laughs> and sitting sitting in bed trying to read it. It was an absolute disaster. So when we got back, I picked up the Black Corridor because, of course, I was going to talk to Derek about it yesterday. And, I mean, that dual narrative of collapsing world and collapsing psychological um, state of the protagonist, in inverted commas, is one of the best and most satisfying things I've read since we kicked off this podcast. And actually probably one of the best and most satisfying things I've read for quite a long time, just because it's so successful in its implementation and in what it sets out to do. And it's dark and it's really, really grim. <laughs> and it's it's not difficult to transpose a lot of the kind of collapsing political situation stuff with what's going on around us right now. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it that with the Black Corridor made you pick it up and and think this is great inspiration for a suite of experimental electronica? Well, as I was reading it, there's lots of reference to music in it. So Mm. there's, there's, there's sort of like repeated themes where... The main what's the, the main character's name? I forget his Ryan. name. Ryan, right? Yeah, the, where he, there's there's moments in it where he's either in a ballroom or he's mm. hearing music, and and it, and it's kind of sort of ingrained in the whole narrative, the sort of musical part of it. And as I was reading it, I was thinking it'd be really good to try and write something or create some music based on it. But I knew I knew I wouldn't be able to do anything directly referencing it in that way mm. if that makes sense mm. um i didn't want to sort of just lift passages and sort of go it's describing this type of music so i'm going to try and make that type of music i just wanted yeah. to absorb it and as i was reading it i was then putting together the music so i was kind of in that space as i was as i was doing it so mm. I, I just bought a a polyen tracker which is a all-in-one audio workstation using like it's, it's basically a tracker like the old school amiga tracker but in a, mm. in hardware and i kind of wanted to have an, a, a project where i could just get absorbed in and the thing with the polyen tracker you can work really quickly um so i was just in that flow state and yeah. the sort of darkness and 
the futuristic side of it where it's it's kind of it feels like now but there's that little step isn't there where mm-hmm. you know they're they they can travel into space and they've they that but everything else just feels like now to to me that's a perfect perfect type of sci-fi where it's mm. close enough in the future that you can mm. you can feel like you can touch it um I'm, i must say we are getting to a point where if i did have a lifeline of taking my family and friends to siberia to murder a load of russian scientists and steal their spaceship <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not quite there yet, but but I'm, I'm not far off, and and we might have uh, we might have uh, a, a slight maybe light at the end of the tunnel is probably the wrong answer because um, I noticed from the news this is really going to date this podcast and set yeah. it in a specific <laughs> moment in time. But I noticed that um, despite the fact she's only been in position a little bit over three weeks, or is it three weeks, there are already letters of no confidence going into the 1922 committee to try and get shut of our glorious leader, which is, uh, yeah. you know, can't happen soon enough as far as I'm concerned. It's, uh, no, it's um pretty quick going for her, isn't it? <laughs> to, yeah. To get it so wrong so quickly. Yeah, and over the last year or so in a professional capacity i've had some exposure to what's going on with free pots not really any direct input to it but actual just exposure to what they're all about and a few months ago i remember having a conversation with one of my colleagues here we've got real life encroaching upon our <laughs> playground here um one of my colleagues and i'd been reading the Institute for Economic Affairs, the paper that they wrote on charter cities. Yeah. And I was talking to a colleague about it and he'd not heard of charter cities and I was explaining it to him. And and it all still seemed probably a little bit further down the track. And then the moment they they get in and the moment they start announcing um, economic investment zones, bad enough that there is masses of sea life washing up dead on the northeast coast because of potentially because of the dredging of yeah, the yeah. of the tees to create um additional draft depth for vessels that will be coming into the free port that just that one thing is an absolute disaster for the environment yeah, and then yeah. when a an organization as staid and conservative as the rspb the royal society for the protection of birds is having public twitter meltdowns about the ramifications of these investment zones because it means that companies can essentially build whatever they want on whatever land they want and pay very little tax because they're just basically are given carte blanche by the government in one of these investment zones. It all starts to feel like we are starting to just live in a dystopian future from a 1970s London weekend television kids TV show. <laughs> it, it, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's feeling, and I guess... Is that it's not no, nostalgia is like a, a fondness, isn't it, for the past? It's what yeah. what's the opposite of nostalgia? Because that's kind of what I feel mm. with what's going on. You know, growing up in the sort of late seventies, early eighties, it's kind of just the same as now, really, isn't it? You've got nuclear threats, you've got yeah. you know strikes, you've got <laughs> all that sort of stuff going on, and and that that resonates in in the Black Corridor because that's yeah. all all happening, isn't it? There's, it's it's just it, it's just the main narrative, isn't it, of, of that story, and yeah. um. It's just interesting how how that sort of it affected me when I read it as a teenager because I always remembered that book. That was one of my, as for a Moorcock book, that was one of the, one of those books that I kind of kept going back to in my mind, sort of thinking mm. about. Is that and Behold the Man as mm-hmm. the stories that I just kept thinking about more so than his sort of fantasy stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and rereading it now, it's just um, yeah, I, there's so many bits that I completely lost. And mm-hmm. had forgotten about the whole sort of music narrative, that the whole I'd completely forgotten the whole bit about going to Russia and stealing the spaceship. I, you know, in my in my mind, it was just him in a spaceship, and it was just, yeah. you know, that was it. I'd forgot the whole build up and how it happened. Yeah, uh, same. Yeah, yeah, absolute same. Uh, this this copy of the Black Corridor I've got isn't the one that Pops gave me back in the day. Um, I think the one that I got off Pops was uh, a later edition probably the one with the Bob Haberfield cover. Mm. But that's long since lost to the mist of time. Um, so when I picked up the copy with the brilliant, um, I don't know, lipstick with nails and part of a stapler glued on cover, 
some of it came flooding back to me immediately. But yeah, I I had no memory whatsoever of the brutal act, like um, dumping his mistress in the anti-femme zone so she ends up with her head on a spike or murdering the and it's really it's really crude it's not crudely worded it's bluntly worded um that he murders the rest of the scientists and the family and friends help him shove them out of the airlock and and all agree that it was the best thing to do it's it's so so bleak and grim but that really only reflects what's going on in in the wider world in uh, in in all of those like little vignettes, those flashbacks to what's going on, those little bits of world building, and it, it's it's incredibly brutal. And I think we've mentioned that that the voice does feel different, probably because a lot of that was written by Hilary Bailey. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, who, as we've discussed before, strange familial connections between <laughs> listeners between Graham and uh, and Hilary Bailey. Well, let's just uh, refresh our memory on that one. Yeah, no, that's so. That's um, that goes back to my wife's family. So my wife's dad's cousin is Laura Mulvey. Uh, so she's famous for uh, uh, coming up with the concept of the male gaze. Mm-hmm. Um, and her and her partner, um, they they lived in Labrick Grove, and they they knew um, Michael Moorcock, but more so Bailey. Uh, they were friends. So so yeah. So she was good friends with her. Yeah. Um, and had this great, I was talking to Laura, uh, about Michael Moorcock and she was like, I'd sort of saying, I didn't know him that much, but then she said, next time you see me, tell me about, uh, my date with Jimmy. And I was like, Jimmy. And she was talking about Jay, uh, uh, Ballard, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, so Jesse Ballard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's uh, quite, uh, quite amusing. I, I've yet to have that conversation with her. So I need to, uh, need to see her and get her to tell me that. Yeah, there's going to be some fantastic stories there, aren't there? Really fantastic. Yeah, but, absolutely. You know what? What, what a, a an artistic community to be part of as well. But this really, really makes me want to read more Hillary Bailey as a result. And I really need to kind of get my head down the Hillary Bailey rabbit hole and see what there is out there that she may have written and that may still be accessible because it's absolutely terrific stuff. And there's something about the absolute bluntness of those flashbacks and what's going on that really kind of elevates this onto a, a slightly different plane to Mocock's usual, certainly his fantasy fur, which whilst it can be intense and rewarding, never really gets as close to the bone and as close, and, and, you know, as close to the knuckle. And, and it needled me, this book. That's what it did. It needled me yeah. on, a number, on a number of occasions and, yeah. and made me think really, really deeply about you know especially the stuff about inaction and the stuff about complacency and you know I, th- I think you can't help but think it fairly regularly with no matter how much this country deteriorates politically and today the pound at one point today reached one point one dollar four cents to the pound going from a couple of year, a few years ago, when it was two dollars to the pound, yeah, yeah. The, the pound has absolutely tanked, and we know we're pretty sure that the chancellor who actually enacted this did it in full, full knowledge that yeah. the that certain people would enormously benefit yeah. from this from shorting the pound. Yeah, yeah, no. So and it's, it's only a few years, isn't it, since we had riots after the murder of a young black man in London. And we actually had riots on the streets in London and buildings burned down and the police lost control of the situation. Those riots quickly spread and there were riots in Birmingham and other places. Only last week we have riots, not riots as such, but large-scale sectarian gang violence on the streets of Leicester. And when you're reading those scenes about looking out of the windows and seeing the rioting on the street... It's easy to feel distanced from that, but it's only 20 years or so, probably a bit more, since the Manningham riots in Bradford, yep. just down the road from me where cars were getting set on fire and turned over. We're never far away from this, are we? No, no it's um, exactly that. And it, it was those moments when I was reading it, I think, that i completely forgotten about when I read it as a teenager. And they, they probably just went over my head. Um, but mm. there's, there's all those bits where he's in a sort of family home and they're 
and there's that sort of coldness and his relationship with his wife is really dysfunctional and yeah and the bits where he's talking about effectively being a manager and that the sort of he's just a very cold impersonal mm. entity isn't it it's just yeah but you kind of do you root for him when you're reading it i don't know it's hard to hard to say really i don't think at any point i was rooting for him i think there's a certain amount of sympathy you have for him early on when he's been on the ship for three years and he's lonely and he's telling the computer that he's lonely and he's using these patterns of behavior and tasks managing his tasks in a way to try and keep them as fresh as possible but it's it's not very long into the book before you get to the point where they decide to they decide to attend the rally. You already know his friend James Henry is an absolute prick, yeah. um, and you very very rapidly find out with the flashbacks to Mrs Ryan when she's cleaning that Uncle Sidney is a selfish prick. You very quickly find out when about um, when you get the background about him and his toy factory. And the fact that he is actively alienating and trying to think of an excuse to get rid of an employee because he's Welsh, while yeah. simultaneously, you know, coming up with reasons to bang off thirty-five percent of his workforce because they have foreign connections or foreign blood, and the way he justifies it to himself as you know a financial write-off that can be recouped within a year because of the tax incentives, very very quickly lose sympathy for him. The fact that he's also a murderous, odious terrible individual only really piles all of that on and then you find out that actually it's not just him he may have done all the actions but the entire family is complicit because they helped him dispose of the bodies of the scientists there isn't a, okay. a, a, there is not one sympathetic character in this entire book with the possible exception of sarah the daughter of the rival toy maker who himself is a patriot and a hollow earther she's potentially the only sympathetic character in the book but even then you don't have time to get attached to her so it's it's a really cold perfunctory picture of just what shits people are <laughs> <laughs> or certainly in this case what shits the english middle class are <laughs> yeah yeah it's um the, the whole narrative is just bleak but captivating that's mm. what i found mm. yeah you know what we can't talk about the Black Corridor forever because I've just talked about it with Derek for about an hour and a quarter. We've touched upon it there, but it was uh, really good for you to pop in and just share your thoughts and also talk about your album uh, regarding the Black Corridor. But the good news is you'll be back very soon because, of course, we'll be covering, as the patrons have voted for it, The Fog. So oh, you, yes. Phil and I, are going to get together and talk about The Fog. Yeah, and I'm quite excited about that because I haven't read it since I was a teenager, but I yeah, have I've... distinct memories of it. <laughs> I can't wait. I've not read it before, yeah. so I can't wait to read it. It's going to be an absolute treat. And over the last couple of days, while I was reading the Black Corridor, and prior to that, I've been, I've been reading all sorts of crap. I've been reading aliens tie-in novels, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like original fiction, best of the alien universe, most of which is awful. But for some reason, I just got an urge to read. Uh, I played the Alien Isolation PC game. Oh, yeah, yeah. And really enjoyed it because it didn't have all the tropes that I find really boring in Alien spin-off media. It didn't have really anything largely, although so there's a minor plot point, it didn't have anything really largely to do with the evil Wayland yutani Corporation. It didn't have Lance Henriksen playing a version of Bishop. It didn't have Colonial Marines in it. And the Alien didn't look like one of the black bug insect type aliens from aliens it looked like the alien from alien right and yeah. it behaved like the alien from alien so i really enjoyed it and then i found out there was an alien isolation tie-in novelization so i thought oh maybe i'll give that a read and i found that you could get a bundle of seven aliens novels for 20 quid and that was one of them so because i'm an idiot and i've got no self-control i bought the bundle mostly awful mostly bug hunts, colonial marines, all the boring stuff that aliens introduced. I know, I know lots and lots of people like aliens, but I find all that pseudo Starship yeah, yeah. Troopers wannabe stuff really, really irritating. But there was one book called The Cold Forge by Alex White, Alien The Cold Forge, which was really, really interesting and really different, largely because the central character was basically Patrick Bateman. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's about an auditor being <laughs> sent to audit a, a science establishment, a scientific research establishment on some asteroid or something. And it's basically it's Patrick Bateman. It's all in the pre- <laughs> it's all in the present tense. A lot of it's from his perspective, and it was really, really super Brilliant. entertaining. There's our spreadsheets so, and uh... yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, you know, it, it, it doesn't talk about who he will listen the news and stuff like that, but you know, it's it's pretty close. Just to being Patrick Bateman is is an exercise freak and he gets sweaty and he and, and, and admires himself and all that business. And also, is is a really vile individual who, who ends up murdering people. So that was really cool. And there's also a follow up called Into Caribdis by the same author, um, kind of a, a an indirect sequel, I suppose, to The Cold Forge which again had a really interesting take on the universe. It takes place on an Iranian colony where they're creating this massive data center and the colonial marines do turn up in it, but they're evil. They're the villains Mm. of the piece. So that was quite different as well. So I really, really enjoyed them. But once I'd got through all that, I got onto the Black Corridor and, but while I've been doing, Excuse me. While I've been doing all this, Phil has been reading the fog, uh, and she'll be she's... sat. She'll be sat at the under end of the sofa to me, going, "Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <gasps> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, oh, th- oh, it's taking me out of it there a little bit with what is written. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she's ahead, head in the fog then. Yeah, she's just about finished it. Oh right. But, it's, a but bit, what... it's quite a big book, isn't it? Yes, it is. So I think when we do cover it, we're, we're not going to be able to do it beat by beat, blow by blow, because yeah. uh, we'll be there for about five hours. But yeah, I think there's plenty there to get our teeth into. And Phil's style is she'll read it, then she'll go back and read it again and take notes. Mm. Whereas um, I'm far too lazy <laughs> to to read the book twice. Well, so, yeah. you know. I've, I've got it on Audible as well, so I'm going to listen yeah. to it. As well. <laughs> yeah. I did actually, after you mentioned going on eBay to try and find the Christopher oh. Lee tapes, um, I did find them on eBay. But 15 quid for a couple of old cassettes that might go and sound like they're underwater plus yeah. i don't own a cassette player anymore sadly yeah, despite the it. fact i've got about seven dungeon synth cassettes on the oh, shelf yeah, I behind see. me yeah, yeah. i don't Very have good. a cassette player i just <laughs> i just bought them as fun things so yeah. maybe i should buy a cassette player but anyway we're off rambling about our next project so graham will be back in a little over a month well, by the time this goes out, it'll be under a month, I'm sure. Might only be two weeks. Shit. I re- we record <laughs> these things. It might take me two weeks to edit all this together. But mm. Graham will be back shortly, and we'll be looking at the fog for our 2022 Halloween special. Mm. Yeah. Exciting Brilliant. stuff. Good stuff. So cheers for dropping in, Graham. No we'll problems. talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for having me. It is dark. Stay in Massive thanks to Derek and Graham for stopping by Darien Toms, and be sure to check out their Bandcamp pages. I'll link to them in the show notes, and do follow them on Twitter and Instagram too. First, imria.bandcamp.com. My recommendation, get the discography. It's a snip at under $20, includes all of his work based upon a range of sci-fi and literary greats. It includes The Black Corridor and all three Dreaming City releases, and there's lots more in there besides. They alone are worth the asking price though several times over, but the number of releases currently stands at 32 and every time I look there's another one, and this show will play out with a choice cut from Imria's The Black Corridor in the form of Triumph in the Bloody Sky and The Human Form is No More. As listeners to the show will already be aware, Graham also hooked up with our old mucker Wayne, aka Nand, for their interpretation of The Black Corridor, and I've snuck a couple of little snippets into this show. And of course Graham is also a duck pond sailor, so... For all of your electronic drone and noise needs, and even a bit of goblin core, go to decadnids.bandcamp.com. And if it's easier, go on Bandcamp, search The Black Corridor, and the Imrea album and the Decadnids vs Nand album will flag at the top of that list. But, as is ever the case with Bandcamp, whenever you search, all sorts of other things pop up on there too. And worthy of a mention here, and adding a psychedelic space rock angle, is the track The Black Corridor from mid-90s album Glare, by Texan experimental outfit ST37. This is a band I was totally unaware of until hopping on Bandcamp just now, but they've been making music since 1989 and are still going strong. So, every day is always a school day. Wonderful. There's been some interesting news on the Mococ adaptation front. Particularly timely, since we only brought back Lord Shark's ostentatious couch last time out, but 
Variety magazine printed some words from David S. Goyer, the prolific scribe of numerous superhero movies and, more recently, writer and producer of various TV streaming series including, most recently, Foundation and Sandman. In the film world, he was also responsible for the script for a pretty mixed bag of movies, including, on the upside, Dark City, Blade, Blade 2, and Batman Begins. So, all good on that score. As well, there were some that received a mixed reception, but I don't have that much of a view on, other than them just being a bit poor-faced and miserable, like Man of Steel, and Batman vs Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Terminator Dark Fate. But, he did write Dark City, so that gets a massive tick in my book. And he wrote Ghost Rider, Spirit of Vengeance, and that film is fucking hilarious. He's also got a story credit on the new Hellraiser film. I saw that a few days ago, and it wasn't really for me. Not nearly sleazy and filthy enough by half. I like the Cenobites, but I'm much more a Frank and Julia mark. Anyway, what in blazes has this to do with Mocock? Well, the Variety article indicated that Goya is in development on an eternal champion TV show, for Apple TV+, Plus, which could be a really exciting move, or, on the other hand, it could just be more grist for the streaming TV machine mill. Time will tell. Now, I'm not on Facebook, because it's a shit pit, and I got fed up of blocking aunties and uncles posting Britain First memes, but Dave posted an excerpt from Mike's post over there, and Mike said, We've been talking to David and Dana for some time, and, like Neil, I assume he means Neil Gaiman, I share contractual working status with them. They're both very smart men, who know what they're doing, and their plans, including getting expert reader advice, are excellent. Their ideas so far mesh with some I had many years ago, producing a script with John Goldstone, producer of the final programme, and the Monty Python movies, about an eternal champion character, and an entry into the series. And just as an aside, you can read that script in one of the Golanks Elric collections. But back to Michael. Negotiations have taken months, it's a lot of books, and they're for all major eternal champion books done by White Wolf, with exceptions like Dancers, Kane, and SF titles. The ex-BBC guys have gracefully acquiesced to retaining their option rights. Our TV is too dumb to get Foundation, but, not having read more than a few pages of the books, we really enjoyed the first episode we were able to catch. It could mean a rethinking of the stories, of course, but I'm confident it will be a good one. He then says something about Tolkien adaptations, but it's clipped off. But he does say, whilst you might not like J.R.R. Tolkien much, he does respect him. So, there you go. He continues, So I'm currently confident that this is a very good thing, and a chance to tell John Dacre stroke the Eternal Champion's story from a new but worthwhile view of the stories. As you can see, we're not changing major themes, as there would be no point in doing it. The multiverse is constantly telling new stories developed from old ones. I suspect you'll be happy with any result. More information when I'm told I can unseal my lips. This came as a surprise to me. I was told I wasn't to say anything yet. So at the moment, I can only amplify what David is publishing in places like Variety. Wink emoji. Hmm. So, it appears that, sadly, this has marked the demise of the BBC Runestaff series, and those rights have been handed back to Mocock. It's three years since we kicked off this podcast, and we mentioned that adaptation very early on in our run. So, another three years of development comes to naught, and another cycle of development begins. So, on the one hand, frustrating... On the other, well, whatever. The books are always better. In other news, we've had some nice feedback about the show again. Specifically, about our amateurish and often drunken readings. Christopher Neely said, You, my friend, have oratory skills. Boss fight level. Final level skills. I will pay good American dollars to hear you read MM literature on an audiobook platform. Well, blessings of the rune staff be upon you, Chris. High praise indeed. And I'll have to work on my accents a bit though, because I can't just stick with a whole one all the time. And one thing you don't hear is how often I flub my lines. But fortunately, editing's a thing. <laughs> but I dread to think how long I'd spend editing and re-recording if I were to pursue it at more length. I'd probably need my very own Clem Fandango at the very least. Over on Twitter, Steve Round said, Just finished listening to the latest podcast by Breakfast Ruins with Sonus Rocks. Great stuff. I could genuinely listen to you both read the whole Hawkmoon series as an audio play. Also, use of the word rotter gave me a grin, and I must now slip it in my next RPG episode. Thanks, Steve. I always drop it on Dave and Laws at very short notice, usually about three seconds, but they always rise to the occasion. And yes, rotter is a great word, and pretty polite by our standards. Before we go, thanks as ever to our patrons. First, those without tear, Anthony Piconti, Sebastian Weetabix, 
Tim Carlos and Dave Dempster, and of course to our chaos engineers, Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Jim Kirkland, and of course there's a new Pursuit of the Pale Prince newsletter out there from Jim, so get on his mailing list. John W. Lays, and John's third book of poetry, When the Banshee Howls and Other Poems, is out for pre-order now. I'll pop a link in the show notes. Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Matt Saltz, Menion, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Simon Perrins, and Tony Malazzo. And thanks to our Jugaderos, Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Tom Murphy, Mark Hebden, Graham Holden, and Jason Connolly. And finally, eternal thanks to our patron demons, Andy Darby, who's coming up soon on a podcast in the very near future, Clark of the Cruel, Fred Keish. Thanks again, Fred, you've been with us on our journey and this whole ride for almost the entirety of our existence, so thanks very much. Gareth Wilson, Imria, Jenny Stim, Jay Racer, Joe Monty, more on Joe in a few seconds, Liam Jay, Miles Reed Labato, Mark Main, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, the OG patron Norman Beresford, and last but never least, Robert McMillan. Now, back to Joe. Joe's the editor at Saga Press, responsible for the recent volumes 1 and 2 and upcoming volume 3 of the new Elric Saga hardcovers that have been gracing our doormats and shelves this year. And of course, just to mess up the symmetry of those book spines on our shelves, December sees the publication of the first new Elric novel in 16 years, The Citadel of Forgotten Myths. Now Joe, being a champ, has offered up an advanced reader's copy for a lucky patron. So, I asked him to pick a number from 1 to 50, and he chose Lucky 13. So, I dove into the chaotic hat of Pat Ferrick, i.e. I looked down the unfiltered and unsorted patron list, and that number corresponds to Neil Burton. So, congratulations Neil, that'll be winging its way to you in the next couple of days. And ahead of the publication on the 6th of December, Joe's planning to stop by Darian Tom's too, so we can talk about his work, Moorcock, genre fiction, publishing, and anything else that crosses our minds. So watch out for that. Right. Breakfast in the Ruins is now three years old, so thanks to all of you pards that have supported us, offered kind words, and listened to our babbling. Thanks to our guests, contributors, and co-hosts. I raise my wine mug to you all. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruins at outlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. You can listen to Breakfast in the Ruins radio via the internet, most easily via Radio Garden, via app or browser. Just search BITR Breakfast in the Ruins or look at the Bradford UK blob on Radio Garden. We've got our Patreon page too, there are a few extra odds and sods on there, but in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Rods. (laughs) 